Honoring our Father by lifting His Son. Our attention should be on His Son. Our attention should be on His Word. Whatever God wants and desires for us so that we can be caught up and God can make all the operations. Now, I told you a couple of weeks ago the importance of words. How many know the words are important? If you're trying to convey something to your, the one you love, Using the right words is going to convey how you feel or what you desire to the next person. Can you say amen? amen. And then the same with our words to God in prayer. And making sure we I I explain to God, you know, the things that we have need of and asking him to get involved. Amen. It's not so much telling him what we're going through as much as asking him to be involved. Amen. And then the other thing is, Think about what God gave us. He gave us the scripture, didn't he? Now, the scripture is full of words. And those words tell stories and show pictures. So here's the thing that God was sharing with me. I said, Lord, sometimes I get kind of goofy when I describe things in pictures, like the God elevator when we come to the Father in Jesus' name, how the Holy Spirit puts us into Christ and Christ lifts us up before the throne of God and does it instantly. I like those pictures because word, pa words paint what? Pictures. And if we don't see a picture of something the way God has it set up, then we can't have faith for it. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing your ability to hear spiritual things by the word of God. Okay, so the word gives us pictures, and the, it paints pictures first. And what are pictures? Pictures are hope. It's like that little uh, uh, thermostat on the side of your wall, you know, where you dial it down, or keep it cool in here if it's a hot day, and you dial it up if it's a cold day, right? So pictures of the word of God that he gives us dials our faith up. So the word of God should never be preached down at people. It should always be preached up at people, sort of like a, a waterfall. And it's what we catch. Look out, Sip. I told you. And not what we hear. We have to catch it, bring it into our bosom, really meditate on those things so that we can see the picture God wants to convey to us. So I, I preach in pictures for that very reason. I, had, I really went after God. I said, God, why do I preach in pictures? Well, all words paint pictures. But there are some favorite teachers I have through the years. How many here have a favorite teacher or two that you listened to through the years that really blessed you? Sure, there's nothing wrong with that. And they used words and spoke things that really ministered to your heart. You see, words are very important, especially when we, when we pray and we're before God. Well, we've been finding out, and this is going to be session three, We've been finding out that there are some prayer mysteries that we need to understand. One of the mysteries we found out is that our words license God to get involved. I'm going to say it again. Our words license God to get involved. In other words, God is not going to throw himself on you, rattle your cage and make you saved. Now unless grandma's praying for you. And I can remember my life. I thought my life was together, you know. But I know my grandmother prayed for me. I know that several other people probably saw me, you know, and said, God, save that man. Do something with him, you know, hard, fast, and continuously. So it was the words of prayer of other people that probably got some of you here. Amen. So let me ask you, how many people are you accurately praying for so that they may taste that the Lord is good. 
You see, sometimes, and I, please, I'm not, again, this is not, this is to get us to think. Sometimes we're so self-occupied, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, set our schedules, that we, we are shut down sometimes in praying for others. Don't be like that, okay? God has given us prayer bombs to lob howitzers over into areas. And now we started lobbing prayer bombs into cities. Can you say amen? And so today we're going we're gonna to start in three. Can we have our scripture up, guys? We're going to start off with a fellow named David. Remember King David? How many know King David got in a lot of trouble? Aren't you glad God didn't say, okay, King David, you committed adultery, you killed the guy who has, has the wife, you did all that, I'm done with you. Listen, God is, now listen to me carefully. God is never done with somebody if they pursue God. He repented, he asked God to forgive him. He had a lot of things. We don't know what he's going through. But we're so quick to judge. We don't want to judge somebody. You understand? Because we don't know what they're personally going through. We don't feel like they feel. But we have compassionate. Can you compassionate towards them? Can you say amen? And what would Jesus do? Jesus would reach out and try to save them. And that's why the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, you who are spiritual... When you correct somebody, consider yourself. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, you see a brother or a sister that's having problems, instead of running over there and telling, I know why you're having a problem. You go to them and say, what can I do? How can I pray? Because we're so quick to kill and to, re and I'm talking about church generally, to pick on false others, and God doesn't want us to do that. Say Amen. And when you begin to mature and you learn how to pray properly, God begins to show you some of the faults of others. Uh oh Not so you can go, hey, Sherry. No, it's so that you can pray. See, a mature Christian restores. A carnal Christian is always picking on the faults and justifying their position. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Listen, I have plenty of faults. You picking on my faults ain't going to cure me. Hello? Your prayer for me is. And they'd be quick to shut your eyes at anything to justify you being mad at me. I'm using me. But that includes anybody. Can you say amen? We're to be lovers, God grace givers, Jesus planners. Can you say Amen. And that's who you are. So let's look at what David, after all he went through, he cries out to God and he says in Psalms 5, 1 through 12, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation, what I dwell on. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto you I will pray, my voice shall you hear in the morning. Oh, Lord, in the morning. You know the song. Oh, Lord, in the morning, I will direct it to you. And I will look up where? What time? Why do you suppose the morning is so important? Because it's the first. First thing. First thing. First thing. God needs to know that you're putting his son first. First by what you say. First by what you do. And this is one of the greatest ways. In verse 4. For you are not a God that takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You shall hate all workers of iniquity. See, that's what's happening right now. Judgment is falling on those that refuse Jesus. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood, and the Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. We'll stop right there. I just wanted the first part anyway. Anyway, so we find out that in order for David to redeem himself, he needed God's help. How many know you can't redeem yourself? I know you guys are good people. You're wonderful people. I love you. Linda loves you and everything like that. But to be better than we are, who do we go to? Who's, who makes all those adjustments? So when you go, so you know, we're not talking about face-to-face -face time. But when we go to God, first thing you say is, God, change me. 
Make me a better man. Make me a better woman. Help me to be a better mom. Help me to be a better grandmother. Help me to be better what I'm doing so that the people who know me can see that I'm getting better with you and they have testimony before their eyes. It's not something I'm saying. It's something I'm doing with you, Father. See, our witness, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. What did God say about Job? Do you remember? He, when Satan says, hey, you got a hedge about Job. What did God say? Here's what God thinks about you. There's nobody like him. He fears God. He shuns evil. He's a righteous man. Now, if you look at the two situations, Job's got an unsaved wife. Job is fearful. Job wasn't just afraid. He was so afraid, he prayed in fear every day. He didn't pray in faith. Lord, I'm afraid of my kids. The wife that I married, she's teaching them how to party and smoke drugs. Oh, what am I going to do? I've added the smoke drugs in there. Modern day. And so he, instead of him seeking God in faith, saying, you can straighten them out, Lord. He was in fear for his family. Being in fear about something will cause the enemy to attack you instead of God protect you. What did God say? Hey, Satan, he's already in your power. He didn't say, I turn him over to you. If you believe God uses the devil to teach you something, you've been deceived. Satan is an arc, complete, absolute enemy of God and enemy of God's people. You don't befriend him thinking that he'll let up on you. <laughs> yes, is there something? Okay, all right. Just want to make sure. <laughs> all right. Are you guys ready to get in this lesson? All right, so good morning to you. Bless you in Jesus' name. Bless you coming into the garage. We have so many more people picking up on the broadcast, and we appreciate it. What we want to do here is we want to educate God's people on how to live their life, all no matter where they're at, and fall in more love with God. And that's what we're all about. Amen? So let's get into this thing. How many here know I've learned some things in prayer so far? Amen. We get in all kinds of testimonies. In fact, I might call on you, Dave, just so that because you shared the other day with me. People are beginning to experience what praying with God is all about. God is seeming to take away some of that excess amount of stress and mess. Right, Dave? Things are mellowing out. Besides the chickens, I mean, what else can God bless you with? <laughs> Amen. So he shared just the other day, you know, he didn't know he was going to do this. And he says, you know, everything is coming together because my time with God. Sometimes we just need a little adjustment to make everything flower up. How many gardeners do we have? What do you do when you look at the plant and it's pretty scrawny? Well, you need to find out what it needs, what nutrients. Can you say amen? Or if you over-nutriented it, over-fertilized it, right? And so we meet with God so we get all God's goods flowing and growing, flowing and growing in us. Can you say amen? All right, take your Bible and go with me to Hebrews chapter 7. I want to let you know that when we begin to pray aggressively now, we're not talking about face-to-face -face time here. We're talking about praying for nations. We're talking about praying for families, praying for cities, praying for counties, praying for uh, the different areas of ministry. You should be praying for this church to grow and develop, that we always stay in God's will, always stay fresh before the Lord. That should be, be your morning prayer, every part of your morning prayer, every morning. Praying for your church, praying for the people that go to your church, the church people, God to increase it, to cause it to grow, develop everything, run in its place. Amen. Can you spend five minutes doing that? Amen. It only takes about five minutes to cover all that. And then ask God to forgive you and cleanse you and wash you so your prayers are not hindered. Say amen. All right. So when we begin to pray aggressively for other people, we join Jesus. Did you know that? The Bible says that two shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask. So when we say, Father, in Jesus' name, the Bible tells us that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying. So when we say, Father, in Jesus' name, we join him. 
So now we've just become 10,000 times more powerful when we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up United States of America. I pray for those in a position of authority. If they're corrupt, they won't listen to you. Remove them and plant in their place righteous people that will do the right legislation. Thank you, Father, that's done. Write it down, stick it on the, the little prayer request still. Because every time you pass the fridge, you're going to slap your hand on it. Say, thank you that this country serves God. Learn to aggressively put pressure and back the enemy off. He's the one that's holding back. He's the withholder. God is not withholding. God is a giving. He's withholding, so we push him back. God turned the authority over the kingdom of heaven to you and I. And if we don't push him back, then he'll just sit there and make faces at you. <laughs> and we'll do one of these things. Tag, you're it. Remember, Satan plays games. That's all he has to play is a game. Okay? But you don't have to play against him. You sit down and let Jesus play against him. Amen. See, that's where we keep failing. We keep feeling maybe something we didn't do or maybe something this and something that. No, sit down and say, whatever it is, God, take care of it. Boom! Just like that. That's how quick it goes. God says, I was just waiting for you to ask. I said, I was just waiting for you to ask. Sometimes we, we think, my dad, I, I love my dad. My dad was an awesome man. He was very practical. I don't want to bother God with spark plugs and the little things I can do. So one day I drove up. My dad's sitting there really frustrated. When my dad was frustrated, he'd always rub his forehead like this. I probably picked up some things from my dad, you know, things like that. And... Uh, <laughs> So he's sitting there next to his Volkswagen. Volkswagen Beetles, when they first came out the first year, they didn't think it through. Sounds like human broken stuff, doesn't it? And so he couldn't get his hand back in the fourth spark plug. Get back. His hand was too pudgy. He didn't think it through. You got to have a little micro hand to get in there, you know. <laughs> so he's frustrated. I drive up all happy. Get up and shout the victory. Don't sit around. Jesus set you free. Hey, Dad, what's going on? Oh, leave me alone. I'm kind of frozen. So what's the matter? He says, I can't get my hand back there doing everything. Why don't you? And I just said, wasn't, I, I meant it, but I wasn't thinking of the respect. I should have slowed down and told him. I says, Dad, just ask God to help you. And then I walked off and went into the house, made myself a sandwich and talked to my mom. <laughs> right? Dad's sitting there. I come out about half an hour later after I raided the fridge. Come on, you can relate, can't I? And then my dad is just grinning eye to eye. His face is just lit up. He's almost laughing. I says, Dad, you asked him, didn't you? Because before he said, I don't want to bother God with something like that. I can do myself. I says, well, Dad, you're not able to do it. So here's what he said. He says, not only that, son, I asked him, but when I reached my hand back there, it fell in my hands. And it was, I just hear God saying, you see, if you, my people would really trust me, you're in a fallen planet, folks. All the resistance from you being childlike before God, any resistance to that, you know who's behind that. So pray and bring the glory of God in, even in a spark plug. You're making a pie, you don't know quite how to make the crust right? Ask God, he's the greatest crust person, or ask Dave. <laughs> Come on now. You see what I'm saying? It's really up for us, I want to encourage you, it's a lack of prayer. Your life's still broken. You still find yourself privy to habits and, and falling and, and still finding your flesh lusting for things. It's a lack of prayer. And what's keeping you probably from praying is the enemy's right on your head saying, you're unworthy. Look, you're just a hypocrite. You're just this. You're just this. So we don't pray. We have the right to sit with God, our Father, and have him change us. 
You don't put yourself in the change room. You'll never get changed. Hello? And that's Satan's biggest trick. Your biggest tool is the change room with God. He's changing you. He's plucking out, planting in. All these things in your soul in, beyond your understanding. So please don't say, I wonder what you're doing to me, God. Because you won't figure it out, boo-boo. Just let that part go and trust your heavenly father to make you sweet, to make you good. Say amen. Hebrews 7. I knew we'd get to it eventually. Listen to this now. Therefore, he is also able. This is talking about Jesus. Able to save us to the uttermost. How many here saved to the uttermost yet? Not quite yet. Here, let me tell you why. Okay. It's good to put your hand up and say, that's me, because that's the ultimate income. But let me show you. When you get born again, which part of you got saved? Was it your head? Was it your flesh? No, it was your spirit. And just so for the people in the camera, everything Adamic, everything evil was removed from your spirit. And God's spirit was put there instead. Okay, so imagine your spirit... And then God's spirit joining forces and, and not being separate in your spirit, but mixed. How many here have your favorite, how many here like coffee? I like coffee. Maybe some of you like tea, but you put a little sugar in there sometimes and you put a little milk in there and you stir all those three chemicals become what you like. Hello. And that's what happened when you got saved. God removed the satanic evil that causes you to be separated from God. Removes it completely from your spirit and puts himself in there and then mixes it up. That's why the Bible calls us a new creature. Because we're not like Adam. We're better than Adam. Because Adam had God with him, we have God. Now you get you got to get this picture. you got to say, God, give me the picture of me, you dwelling in me. Let me understand the power of that. And then God starts giving you the pictures, showing you who you really are. Because remember, the withholder, the, the one that blinds people's minds is trying to keep you from all that you are. So we are being saved to the uttermost if we continue our prayer habits. So he who's begun a good work in you will finish that work when he comes or when you go to be with him. Shouldn't you say amen? So it says, therefore, he's also able to save us to the uttermost. Those who come to God through him, Jesus, since he always lives to make intercession for us. So God, right now, if nobody else was praying for you, God is praying for you. So you succeed and that you grow. And Satan's going, oh, yeah, but you're too unworthy. You yelled at your grandkids. You did this. You did that. You told the pastor off. Bah, 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 bah. And so what? You go right in there and get fixed. Hey, if your car is limping, you take it to the mechanic. I'm, if you can afford it. <laughs> Jesus, listen, he paid all the price for us. So he doesn't charge. He doesn't charge. It's all been paid for. Somebody died and rose again, paid all your bills. Everything that you might have owed, everything that you could have even done wrong, he's paid and wiped them out. Now he says, dwell with me and let me teach you my ways. Come unto me, he said, and learn from me. He said, not learn about me, learn from me. And that learning from him comes with that face-to-face -face relationship. Man, some of you should be spending days in there. You're so behind. Don't <laughs> laugh at me. Okay. All right. So, a couple of points I want to give you. Number one, when we come face-to-face -face with our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, God transforms us, just like you would see Peter, James, and John seeing Jesus transfigured. He's... This is our soaking and our adjustment time. This is not our praying for others time. Because we need to be adjusted. 
I'm better than I was yesterday, and yesterday was pretty good, my wife tells me. <laughs> there you go, wow, that's good. All right. I'm scoring pretty high there, huh? Huh? Okay. All right, two. When we come to God, we pray for others. So this is what we're going to be dealing with today. We start to pray for others. Let's say there's somebody at the mall, and he's like, God forbid, he's yelling at his wife or somebody. And you say, oh, that's just terrible. And you don't know the guy's name. So you go, Lord, see that man right over there? I bind that up in Jesus' name. See, so you're the police force in the earth, per se, because you bring God on the way. So you see something you don't like, you pray about it, right? You bind up the anger, you bind all that stuff, and you release the angels in there. I've seen them drop to the ground while I pray things like that. He was ready to slugger, you know, and the power of God just leveled them. That's how powerful you can become. Poor, poor Linda back there. I, the other day we were talking, you know, and I happened to raise my voice one time and I said, hey, Jesus, you could see the spirit of God hit her and her, her hair went back like that. Sorry if I kind of startled you. <laughs> oh man, we've seen, we've seen people leap out of wheelchairs, all kinds of things. Do not limit your God. It isn't you. It's your God. So think about it. God is 99.9% .9 God. And you, 0.1% ask. Hello? Ask God to get involved. Back off then. Stop fiddling with it after you ask him to get in charge. If you don't take your hands off of it, God has to obey your will. And if you're unwilling to let it go, he'll wait till you do. So let things go quickly and ask God to get involved. Say amen. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because look at this. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 through 34 tells us why. Okay, I'll wait till you get there. I'm going to take a sip of uh, water. I love you guys so much. You are so blessed. All right, so listen to this. He who did not spare his own son, who was that? Who didn't spare his own son, but saw that he was crucified for us? Our father. Right? Come on, you guys. This is not a hard question. Okay. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, all human beings. How shall he not with him, with Jesus, you and I are with Jesus, freely give us what? Freely give us what? All things. Okay, how about a car wreck? So it's not that kind of all things. And how about a plane crash? No. So it's not that kind of all things, is it? What kind of all things? Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, All things have attained to life and godliness. Okay. So all things that pertain to life and godliness are working together for your good. No matter what you experience outwardly, your inward man is being renewed day by day. So we don't look at things outwardly. Paul said it this way, I know no man after the flesh. Even though I have known the Lord after the flesh, I don't know him like that anymore. What's he saying? I know God after the spirit. I know my brothers and my sisters after the spirit. I don't know you after your faults. I don't look at you as you're going to rebuke me every time you walk by me. I look at you as somebody that God is using, God's child, and with great respect... I handle you with care because you are God's property. But I would be doing a misdemeanor not telling you how much power and how much authority you have as a believer and not teach you or train you how to get your hands on it. It all deals with two things. Look at your neighbor and say, two things. Now, besides the Lord and God, okay, two things. Your countenance and your tone. Satan sees your countenance. And if you're down, get up right away. Don't sit there and go, oh, uh, and let that run. That's a pattern he runs on us. All of us have different patterns he runs on us. But don't stay down. Amen? Worst thing about being down is staying down. Get up. Get to God. Get everything going. So it's your, it's your countenance 
the light shining out of you, and your tone. For example, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Is that a good tone? No. Satan listens to tones. And it's now, oh, listen to me. Only if you're doing something for God, he'll assign a spirit to listen, to watch your light and watch your tone. He's running a algorithm on you, watching you, because you are starting to win souls and change lives. You're starting to get a business, and you're getting money. So you'll run an algorithm on you, hoping that you'll go back to the old habits that you had that left, you, left an open door like Job where he could come in and attack. Everyone say, not me. I pray daily. I'm soaked in God. I'm filled with God. I'm wearing God. I'm moving in God. What are you doing? <laughs> Listen, you get a little excited like that. I know I, I do. Spirit of God gets on me. There's no devil in hell anywhere around by the time I say my four words. Guarantee he can't handle the anointing. And you have God on the inside of you. And any time you want, midnight, 3 o'clock in the morning, you feel like something's going on, you can open your mouth and release God on that situation. Say, I can open my mouth and release God on that situation. Instead of me. 99.9% .9 God, David, and 1% asking him. Ask and you shall, seek and you shall, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Glory to God. And we got a whole bunch of shut doors now. We're going to need to start opening them. Satan is trying to keep us out of certain areas, praying for our legislation. Oh, uh, what's his face? Sign some kind of decree. <laughs> Remove it. Take your prayer and start removing that. Okay, you ready to get into this? That was just the introduction. <clears throat> All right. So Romans 8, finishing up with this. It says, who is, who is he that condemns? Folks, who's, who's the one that condemns you? Okay, so the next time you hear these words saying, you're not anything, poor me, who's saying that to you? Well, and how come you're hearing it? Because he has access, remember? The only way to shut his access down is you to soak in God. Then he can't talk to you. Remember when you got that helmet of salvation on? That shields any words to your brain that's not of God. It really does. You've been in ministry and intensely praying for somebody. Was your brain thinking about what you're going to eat? No. You see, Satan is a master at either or. So let me tell you something here. I didn't plan on sharing this, but I'm going to share it with you. The way Satan works is he gets you to be against something, to be at odds with somebody. You might not agree with what I preach sometimes, but don't tell people, don't stand at odds, because now you're feeding the devil. You just gave him lunch. Hello. And when somebody says, you go to that church, it says, yeah, I like Pastor Kerry. Don't you know that he, he's, a, he, he's one of these? I says, well, I know you're at odds with him, so you're just giving the double lunch. You see how simple that is? It's not hard. So what Satan loves to do is get people to be at odds with one another. A new person will come to church and a person that used to do that, now that person's doing that and the other person's supposed to move along and do something else and now they're mad at that person for doing what they were doing and you see, now they're at odds. Hello, you just give the devil lunch. You mad at me? Come talk to me. Say, I get really mad at you when you do this. Don't run around and talk to your husband about it. You just gave the devil lunch. Don't feed the devil. Let's put up a little sign, Brian. It says, around here, we don't feed the devil. <laughs> don't feed the devil, Dave. <laughs> Hello? 
So we feed him this way by allowing odds. The Bible says, mark them that cause divisions and keep no company with them that they may be ashamed. How is a person going to know they're doing wrong if everybody just buddies up with them and kind of shines on all the nasty stuff they do? There has to be a standard somewhere. Jesus is our standard. Can you say amen? We're not a judge. We're lovers. We're prayer warriors. Can you say amen? All right, so God says, the last part of this, that Christ who died and furthermore also is risen again. Where is he? It says in Romans 8 verse 34, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. So guess who's praying for you every day? Jesus Christ. The man Christ. The Christ man. You ever wonder what, why it says Jesus Christ and other times it says Christ Jesus? Anybody? Raise your hands if you ever believe wanted to know. Okay, when it says Jesus Christ, it means humanity to God. And when it says Christ Jesus, it's deity to humanity. That's all. So when you see Jesus Christ in the phrase, it means that he's compassionate towards humanity for deity. And when you see it, Christ Jesus, you see that God is compassionate through humanity, Christ, for humanity. See, so that's just the reason. But see, we lose those things, those wonderful understandings of those things, through all of this weird teaching. Hey, I got four points to give you how to be good, and if you don't, <laughs> listen, you're not going to ever be good without God. Without Him, we can do nothing. Once we embrace the truth, then God says, you and I, though, we can do all things through Christ. Right? Ah, see? Christ in head, Christ leading, we follow. We don't follow and say, hey, Jesus, get over here and bless me. Let's move on. Today we're going to cover these things. You're kidding me. Yes, living, <laughs> inviting God to do the work instead of us. Can you say amen? We're going to talk number two, praying for those in authority. Pray for me. If it's something I do that bothers you, pray for me. That God make me even better. For heaven's sakes, by, by being mad at me, you think that's going to change me? I'll tell you one thing that will just ticks, ticks a pastor off. Is being rebellious and sassy. Don't ever do that to a pastor. Because immediately he'll just think you're a devil. You know, so don't, don't do that. Be, show respect. If there's something you've got to correct me, pull me aside. Say, Carrie, you got bad breath. <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying? And you love one another. I'm not going to try to, you know, do what I did with Seth and throw the football at him. You know, I don't want to put you really on the spot, but we need to really realize that the lack of growth in our life, look at somebody say, the lack of growth in my life, is my fault, not anyone else's. So we just go to meet with God and he'll redeem our time. He'll make up that difference. All right, let's go on. So thirdly, we're going to show you how to be watchful in prayer for others, especially in the ministry. And then number four, we'll cover prayer in invasions. How to bring a prayer invasion. How many remember back in the olden days, Brian? Seth, they had prayer meetings. What an idea. When are some of you guys going to come early and start a little prayer circle before our service? Hint, hint. And pray for everything that could go wrong before it ever does. And bring in the glory of God. I have a picture, i got to find it though, down in my old church we used to have a prayer circle and everybody would be praying for the service for every piece of equipment, asking the glory of God to come, new faces to come in, just praying and praying. And so one of our photographers, I can't remember his name, went around, took a lot of pictures for everything, caught a picture where the glory of God was coming now while we were praying. And you could see the Holy Spirit working on all the people in that circle. I mean, and it was not trick for photography. When he developed it, we had it in the papers, we, all kinds of things. So there's all kinds of 
of wonderful things we can do when we join together and learn to shoot prayer bombs. Can you say amen? Be a sniper, learn to lob grenades, run a howitzer, learn to fly in and drop bombs. We're going to cover that in the last part of this lesson today. Amen! All right, first point. Inviting God to do the work. Father, in Jesus' name, this person seems to be really out of sorts. I don't want to touch them, nor I want to tell you what to do. But I'm asking you to go into their life and work out all of the bugs and the things that cause them to harm others. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Then to say, you know who that is? Slap some kind of prayer contact on it. And every time you go past it, slap your hand on it and say, thank you, Lord. Then that list can get pretty long, can it? I said, the list can get pretty long. So what if the list is long like that? Pull it all up, put it in one spot, and slap your hand on it. God knows every name. He knows every detail. Everything about all those people, because you prayed for them at least once. Now you wrote them down. Now you're slapping your hands on that same prayer and all the extra stuff goes in. So what you're doing is you're putting prayer pressure, backing off the enemy. But we don't stay consistent. We only pray when things are going bad sometimes. And, you know, listen, that's okay too. But don't be that way. This country needs some help. They need, this country needs your prayers. Bringing God in, moving into the legislation and into all of the different offices. Now, I don't want to, see, I don't want to be a politician. Good God, my past is, is too dirty. <laughs> so is yours. You know, they're going to dig up everything they can, especially if you're not of their party. You see what Satan's done with the whole, it's a game for the devil. And these poor people that are in the office and working hard and every stuff, we're, we, they need our prayers. Because he's just playing hookabooko with them. Some of them in there so long, they got cars named after them. My goodness, you know. One guy had a memorial and he wasn't even dead yet. Moved right along. Inviting God to work. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1, please. Verse 9 and 10. God is speaking to Jeremiah about being a prophet to the nation. <coughs> Excuse me on this, but you are in the New Testament. Your words are important. You might not be a prophet, but your words are prophetic. If you speak the word of God, it's a more sure word of prophecy. The reason why you don't see me online giving you words and sharing, I could do that all day long. Is I'm not trying to draw attention to me. Prophets have that problem. They're good people. They're wonderful people, but they're usually odd. Different. Look at John the Baptist. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. He ate bugs. Wore fur. Huh. I had a joke there, but I didn't want to say it. Anyway, so prophets are unusual because they're forerunners. We have a bunch of prophets that are good right now prophesying. But one thing about a prophet, every say, what is that, Pastor Kerry? Is a New Testament prophet different than an Old Testament prophet? Old Testament prophet foretold. Foretold of what was coming. New Testament prophet speak forth what's coming. The moment they speak, it's happening. So it's more of a right on than it's coming, okay? So in the New Testament, every one of us that speak the word, it's a form of prophecy. Preaching, the Bible says, is the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy. So when I'm preaching the word to you by the anointing, I'm prophesying to you. It should be an uplifted message. Could you say amen? So in Jeremiah, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because the Israelites split into two. One that kind of represented the heathens, the Gentiles, Judea, and the other one, Israel. And he'd weep over the backslidings of the people. But God says, look, Jeremiah, you're not a kid. I'm going to anoint your words so that you can pluck up, root out, and you can destroy the works of the enemy. Every one of you 
has that ability. So let's see what he said. Take this to your heart. Okay. In Jeremiah 1, verse, 10, uh, verse 9 and 10. It says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Imagine this. Okay. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. How many here know that when you're standing before God, you better have the word in your mouth? Don't go, oh, God, change Pastor Kerry is a real jerk. Please don't say that in front of your father. You're liable to get those escorted back down quickly. Amen. We don't want to do that. Okay. I use me to get picked on because I don't want to, you know, even suggest to anybody else. You guys don't get picked on, do you? All right. So... <laughs> he says, I'll put my words in your mouth. Okay, now listen. See, I have this day set you over the nations. Do you believe that you're over the nations, folks? You belong to the kingdom of God, don't you? Isn't Jesus your Lord? Isn't he the person that rules this planet now with you? Right? So you're over the nations. You're over the kingdoms. Okay? To root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. That's what a person does in prayer. This is a prophet of the Old Testament, but you and I have God in this, don't we? So when we pray, we're very powerful. It's like David with the slingshot. God is right on his side, wiped out the giants. When we pray and we start praying for things, you have authority over all nations. Because Jesus has authority over all nations. So you can say, Lord, in Russia, the people there are fighting and they're killing innocent people. I command that in Jesus' name to stop. God, go in and do your best. Do what you do best. Excuse me, I said it wrong. Do what you do best and take care of it. Thank you, Father. So you have authority over nations, over kingdoms. Amen. Kingdoms are like black, white, okay, Yellow and red, black and white, yellow and red, you know, this kind of thing. Those are different ethnic groups. You have authority over that. You have authority over anything that tries to fight against the will of God. You have authority over that. Not only that, you can pluck up, root down, and destroy all in your prayer closet, not losing the sweat. You just got to be organized and know how to do it. So this series, we're going to show you how to do it. How to get in there, be prepared, and how to literally mow down the resistant factor. And to do it three months in advance. I'm going to stare at you for a while. Why do we pray at the moment? How come we don't pray for the future? Hello? Get your prayers out there three months. And, and here, this is a joke. The reason why you're not, your prayers are not out there three months, because you're hardly in there with God. You know I'm right. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm just saying you watch the immense change that happens to you when you put God first, the immense change, so powerful, you won't even be able to grasp it. You'll wake up to what God has already done in your life. It's our trying to figure things out ahead of time that kind of messes us up. All right, everyone say, thank you, Pastor Kerry, I love you. <clears throat> so you can root out, pluck up, tear down. You can bind up the enemy. You can remove his assignments. Whatever you bind on earth, bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loosed in heaven. Hello. And fear not. Because of Jesus Christ, we have authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means should be able to hurt you unless you're hanging out on top of the car at 55 miles an hour. Hey. We had, I used to be with guys. Says, hey, you just hold the speed and they'd get out of the car. Only once. Got out, 
didn't shut the door, but stood there and waving like that. Thank God there was an FBI agent behind me. <laughs> Pulled us over. He yanked those guys out. He only read us a riot out. He said, what in the world are you doing? I was a kid once. You realize I was behind you. You didn't even have no idea. You could have fell. You could have done any of that kind of stuff. Sometimes our troubles are, man, are we make them. Most troubles we make. So instead of condemning yourself, God already knows that. He's got to get you to be with him so he can fix you. So stop keeping yourself sick by not meeting with God. And, and folks, there's other sicknesses besides, you know, physical. There's mental illness, feeling, you know, corrupt, feeling bad. I mean, I can tell you, certain, there's certain times in my life where these drifting evil spirits will drift in and suddenly there's a whole mood change came out of the blue and you're going, what is that? That's migrating spirits coming to see how you're doing. So rebuke them and move it out. Anytime you sense a change that's not your normal with God, bind and rebuke it. God's not trying to show you something. The devil's trying to get you to think of yourself. Someone say amen. So in prayer, learn to pray for others. You can pull it out of them. You can put it in them. All in the power of Jesus' name. Now, become creative. All right. Matthew, look at this. This is great. Matthew 9, 36 through 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were as sheep scattered, having no shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful. You are praying, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. You have the ability to ask God for reinforcements. For ask God to send people. You got a son that's wayward and he hasn't been able to listen to you, mom or, or our father. Ask God to send someone that can relate to him and share Christ with them. Amen. Come on, be creative. If you got a dog biting your leg, don't call the dog. I got a dog biting my leg. Oh, I've got all kinds of problems. No, call, call the dog catcher. Get him off your leg. Call God in and remove that situation. God says, I'm just waiting for you to ask. So we always think God might say no. Do you know, where is that? Where God says no. It's only in James. And he says, you ask amiss because you ask it upon your lusts. But it says all the promises of God are in him, yes. And in him, Amen. So your prayers are already answered. Just ask. As long as it's not lustful. God, I want that guy's wife. <laughs> Peggy will tell you sometime. Pull her aside. She says, she'll tell you. She says, there were people coming all over when I had my other church saying that God wanted me to marry them. I was already married. <laughs> this is how crazy some people get when they're not with God. There's no anchor. We have a whole entire Northwest full of people that don't belong to any church, don't belong to any pastor. They're their own little groupy group. And what they're doing is they're creating a bad testimony to God. Okay? Bad testimony. Because they're, they're, they're rolling up pillows, Brian. <laughs> Suck it in the Holy Spirit. At a glow meeting? This is how crazy Satan is trying to make the church. So that the world looks at him and says, I don't want to be a part of that. That's creepy. Hello? No. We're setting the standard. Can you say, man, I'm not talking about just us as a church. But the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Us. We need to set the standard as a witness. Can you say, Amen. And I need my shoes to quit sticking to the carpet. All right, so let's move on to my next point. Two, praying for those in authority. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Folks, let me just encourage you. 
If you're going to be a good prayer warrior and a person that really gets a lot done in prayer, only takes a few minutes, then you have to really watch what you say about those people you don't like. Listen, don't talk bad about our president or the, who's ever in office. Just don't do it. Poor guy, pray for him. We can rail on anything. We see injustices everywhere we go. People doing this and people doing that. And who do you think's making all that mess? Satan is. And why do you think that mess is so attractive to you? To draw you away from praying about it instead of about worrying about it and commenting about it. Hello? Not good. If you're one that uses your words and you speak and you know that every idle word will give an account thereof, then we want to make sure our words are good and we don't rail against people we don't like and authority. Peter said it this way. Peter said even the devil over arguing over Moses' body, excuse me, not the devil, but Michael the archangel and arguing over Moses' body, remember? Moses is dead. But, but Satan wanted the body to make it a shrine. And so Michael arguing with says, no, we're not going to give it to you. Michael brought no reeling accusation against the devil. And I wondered about that. And I wondered, I said, Lord, why is that? And God says, you ever heard about reaping and sowing? If you rail on something, even if it's unfair, the railing is opening up you for attack. Instead of railing, pray. Because we ray, and we, we talk about it. Now listen to me carefully. We talk about injustices and everything. Now we need to go pray. We got to erase all those words. Because it says, stay away from those who speak evil of those in authority, who talk bad about governments and officials, for they are there. We're supposed to respect them, even though we might not like what they do. So what do we do? We don't like what they do. We pray for them. We don't rail on them. So the devil picks up and says, I can whack Peggy. I can whack Carrie because she's railing on authority figures. You cannot rail on authority figures because you break one of the principles God says. It's rebellion and it's the spirit of witchcraft. So whether we know it or not, ooh, boy, you want to give them a thing or two with your mouth? Give them a thing or two before God in prayer and let God recompense how you feel. That's how we fight, folks. It doesn't do me any good to rail about things that are injustices and about this and about that. And preachers do. We're not supposed, my job is not to preach politics to you. My job is to preach Jesus to you and teach you how to have such a relationship. You can change your surroundings. You can put God to practice and you and God can make a success of your life. That's you. But railing against something you can't change. And I used to be it. God one day told me, he says, Carrie, if you're going to move prophetically and you're going to have more power in your life, then stop calling people names. Look at me. You call people names? Have you ever drove on the freeway and somebody pulled in front of him and you went, a stupid person? Oh, okay. Not necessarily road rage. You're just always used to calling people names. You were raised like that, you idiot. Why are you doing that? Man, you're just a clam dunk. You know, I used to do that all the time, and God one day says, Ugh. how can you prophetically speak good and then out of the side of your mouth call people names? It shorts out the power, son. It shorts out the power. Shut the bad filter down. Don't let the bad bitter water come out of there. And open up your spirit. Otherwise, be quiet and be still and give praise. I say, thank you, God. Are you with me? Don't rail against things. Say, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't like it. I'm a citizen of not only the earth, but I'm a citizen of the United States of America. This is my country, and it's not the devil's, so I'm asking you to remove it. When you learn to pray that way, remember your covenant. and Hold your hands up. Say, remember your covenant, Father. 
that you will not suffer the righteous forsaken. And then start quoting back to him. God gets so turned on about it, he just moves an entire mass of angels into that area. We have not because we... You don't realize how powerful what I just said to you. That was James, Jesus' stepbrother. I learned by watching Jesus, your words can change things. Your life a disaster? Try checking your words. Otherwise, check out. <laughs> All right, just kidding. Move to my next point. So, therefore, I exhort, first of all, supplications. That's petitionings. Lord, your word says, Lord, your word says. Lord, you said in your word. Prayers, intercessions, Lord, I pray in behalf of another they might not know to ask. And the giving of thanks, Lord, thank you for answering the prayer for kings and for all those in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior who desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Are you with me? So we pray for authorities, we don't curse them. Say amen. Somebody slaps you on one cheek, what do you give? Do you know why the other give the other cheek? So you don't get caught up in railing against somebody. Because railing against them, Satan knows he can feed on them. You just gave him a hamburger. Okay, look up at me. If you've been doing that, don't beat yourself up. Just say, Lord, help change me. I could see some of you are going, oh, man, I've been messing up. Don't do that to yourself. Just be glad that I spoke something and it caught you, and now you can go talk to God about it. Amen. And man, watch. He'll heal you all up, and then your life will take in even a greater blessing. Can you say amen? amen? When God, see, folks, our generation's been taught by the devil. If we, we tell them, or we, if I tell my kids, I need you to do this. First thing they will think is, I'm picking on them. That's the lie of the devil. If I tell any of you, and you're of that generation, I say, I need you to do this. Don't look at me and say, you weren't nice enough. You see how dumb all that stuff is? Since when do you become God? Are you the pastor? Hey, let me take a vacation. You pastor the church. Let's see how many are left. You see... Let's stop assuming ourselves something that we know better than everybody else. And let's start loving one another and praying for one another. Loving one another. I love every one of you, what you do, what you are. You are God's children. Anything other than that that doesn't quite fit that, you know where it comes from. You know where it comes from. Satan's an accuser. He's the one that causes suspicion. Discernment is not suspicion. If you suspect somebody's doing something, let it alone. Just pray. God, if they're doing something wrong and it's harming them, Lord, change them. Love them. Yeah, that's much better than going, I think Pastor Curry's up to something. Yeah, I'm shrinking five, seven and a half now. I used to be five, eight and a half. What's happening, Linda? <coughs> All right. So, we need to pray and learn to be watchful. My third point, be watchful for everybody. If I see you're going through something, one of the things, let me explain to you. I see by discernment. Now, it's hard for me to explain this, so I'll explain it. The, the, the gift of a pastor, the office of the pastor, not the man, not me, but the office of the pastor, <coughs> one of the things is, sorry, is we have equipment that's supernatural. As a pastor, there's a whole set of equipment that goes with the pastor's position. This is something that I didn't do, didn't earn. It's something that goes with the office. And one of those giftings is discernment. It's not suspicion. It's discernment. In other words, I can see your countenance. I can see if your countenance is up or I can see if it's down. 
And you say, well, stop looking at me. <laughs> no, the person, the reason why God shows me that is so I can pray for you. God, show them whatever's working in their life that's not really good. Help them to see it and help them to work it out with you, Father. Thank you. See, and, that, and, and having that gift operate, I'm able to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me what he wants to do, hopefully to give you words to encourage you to fix you. Amen. That's why a preacher should never preach at anybody. Hello? Had a, I had a person one time, he loved to talk down to people and couldn't figure out why he didn't have any friends. <laughs> Don't talk down to people. I have to watch that. You know? Amen. So everyone see amen. amen. Being watchful in prayer for all the saints. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. This is on the armor, but he says something right in the middle of this. In verse 18, he says, Praying always with all kinds of prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful, to this end, with all perseverance. In other words, you're supposed to be instant in season, ready to pray at any time, and supplication. What are you watchful for? All the saints. I wonder where so-and-so is today. Let's pray for him instead of wondering. I wonder what happened in this situation. Let's pray for him instead of wondering. I wonder why they're going through this. Let's start wondering. Let's pray for them. Keeps us out of trouble. Can you say Amen. Because some of our, listen to me, some of us wanderers get to become worriers. And then wanderers afterwards. If you have to understand everything, you're going to mess up. If you just say, Lord, I take it by faith and I know everything you got is good for me. You got it. God says good because... Man, it's been a slow deal trying to get pie your thinking, son. <laughs> Moving right on by. All right, praying for those in authority. We did, amen. Being watchful for all the saints. Look at this one. First Peter chapter 4, 7 and 8. But the end of all things is at hand. How many believe it's pretty close? Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have a fervent love for one another. For love covers a multitude of... Okay. Let's say I see John Doe down at Kelly's Bar. Okay. Immediately, I got a bunch of ladies in, in, you know, in the back and my wife. And we're going by. And then John Doe comes out of Kelly's Bar. And one of the ladies say... What's he doing in there? And the other lady says, yeah, that's a terrible thing. And my wife turns around and says, both of you be quiet. He could have been delivering something. You see how the devil gets into that? True story. I know a guy, his, um, I'm trying to remember his name, but in California, years ago, he did the backward masking tapes on rock and roll music, playing them backwards. Uh, Greenwald, Gary Greenwald was his name. I don't know where he's at, so I haven't looked him up lately. But he did a teaching called Beware of the Chicken Pickers. <laughs> Dave, you will love this. Chickens pick at everything. And in it, he tells a story of a pastor whose life was ruined because he loved a street witness. So one afternoon, he was taking a bunch of people to street witness, and the people in the bus coming along with him didn't quite make it. They got caught in traffic. So he's out in front of all of these prostitute areas and he's witnessing. Sister Busybody comes by, sees him there and assumes he's up to no good. So she gets on the phone when he gets home and kind of lets it slip. We need to pray for the pastor. And the other one starts to talk about it. Another talk. True story, he says. This pastor's life was ruined on somebody's guessing what he's doing. End up, he was talking to an old friend that became a prostitute, trying to win him to the Lord. The rest of the team was late. And, and you know, his answer was, next time you want to destroy somebody's life, treat it as a pillow. You're standing at three stories up, and you ripped a feather pillow right out of the window. And all those 
feathers went everywhere. Now imagine yourself going and try to collect all of those words, those feathers you opened your mouth and shot out there. So if you're going to be somebody powerful, the mouth has to be in check. And if you're going to move mountains, chain nations, pluck up, ruin Satan's kingdom, you've got to have your armor on. You can't have loose lips. They sink ships. Hello? We're moving in a revival. Have you noticed? We're starting to pick up and the momentum's going. And immediately Satan will go to several people and start to get you talking and criticizing. That's a trick of the enemy. Because as soon as you start doing that, the power, God's not going to bring anybody else into a church that's all riled up and picking on each other. God is a Jew. And I've never met one that's poor or doesn't know how to invest. <laughs> He's not going to build up a church where people are mad at each other. Do you understand me? You and your stuff stays home. You bring your God want, your God need, and your God communication here at church. You leave the mess at home. Can you say amen? God will meet you here. He'll help you here. And then when you go home, you'll be able to deal with what the devil is doing. Are you with me? Do you love Pastor Kerry? You praying for me hard, fast, and continuously? <laughs> amen. I love you dearly. Okay, so, so be watchful for other people. And if you see something wrong, God's showing you so you could pray to make up it, to make the difference, not to criticize. And so ask God in your prayers, God, help me not to be a critic. Anybody can sit back and criticize. I mean, Brian painted these beautiful things out there, and somebody had to open their mouth and criticize, well, you should have made it over here. <laughs> well, good, I'll let him know. And it's not a very good thing to be talking like that around. Uh, not at all. You make no criticism. This church needs a lot of work. But criticizing ain't going to help. It makes your smart man, woman of God, hang around here, we'll train you. Okay, so that's to my last point. You see something doing that? I just immediately went to prayer. I didn't want to see you. When people are like that, you don't want to engage them. Or try to correct them. Because they're in no mood to correct. You just go pray for them. And all of a sudden the whole outlook has changed. And you go, isn't that wonderful? I didn't get engaged in that mess. Are you with me? So it says, but to this, but to all things, the Lord is at hand. Be serious and watchful for prayers for all saints. All right, let's go to my last point. Prayer invasion. Everyone say, I have the ability to bring God in an invasion. Okay, so let's look at the scenarios. Whose planet is this? It belongs to God, but God gave it to man, right? And we know who man gave it to, but didn't Jesus get it back? So we'll start from there. Jesus got it back. But then said, I have all things subject unto me, Yet not all things are under my feet. What is he saying? He's saying you and I have to deal with our citizenship, where we live, on the planet we live, and kick Satan out of our properties, out of our families, out of our nations, out of our works of God, can you say amen? That's who we are. So we need to learn how to lob prayer bombs. So go with me to Mark 16 and we'll finish up with this. You know the scripture. This is a great commission, but it's, it's printed in a servant attitude. In other words, quickly. So Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Good news, folks, to every creature. My birds love it. 16, and he who believes and is baptized shall be what? Let me kind of put a poo-poo to false teaching. This is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about being baptized into Christ. 
He that believeth and accepts Jesus Christ shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. So the first baptism that gets us saved is being baptized into Jesus Christ. Can you say amen when we get born again? Because that's what that one is about. It's not about, about water. Okay? Because it doesn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized. Hello. So let's get on past that and look at this. Okay? Okay? And he who believes not will be condemned. And these signs will follow the apostles. These signs will follow the prophets. The pastors. Those that believe. Everyone point your finger at yourself. And say, am I doing these things? You should be. Because the one that does them is in you. So what a lot of Christians haven't learned is they don't know how to release God out of their words. They don't know how to release God out of their hand. They don't know how to release God when they move. You see, for in him we live and we move and we have our existence. Not only is God with me, God is for me, God is in me, and I am in God. What's the devil got? Nothing. He's just a liar. And he gets pleasure out of convincing you you're not anything. Tell him who you are. I'm a child of the most high God. I'm, I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. My store is blessed. My children are blessed. My grandchildren are blessed. I'm blessed lifting up things. I'm blessed running out things. Everything that I put my hand to is blessed. Because that's who God says I am. Now, that's a good testimony, wouldn't you say? All right. So, these signs shall follow my, them that believe my name. They shall cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is how to strategically take over an area. When Linda and I bought this property, the first thing we did is cast out all the devils in here. We bound all the devils controlling this property and removed their assignment. Then we prayed. It says, speak in tongues. Listen, every one of you has a prayer language. Whether you have it manifested or not, it's up to you whether to allow that or I can, I can get you to open up and you can get that. But you all have a God-given language that's resident in your spirit, whether you use it or not. But it says there, if you use it, you'll build yourself up. So when you go into an area and you remove all the controlling evil spirits, you pray and build yourself up. Why? Because you're going to go in as a, a laborer, a harvest of the last days. Well, so we moved into the property and we started dealing with things. You know, when you move into a property that was owned by the devil, then the devil's going to use people to cause to stir up things. That's what the scripture says, and you shall take up serpents and they shall not harm you. To take up serpents doesn't mean handle a snake. It means handle the snakes, the people that are snakes. How to handle their lies, their tactics, how to handle the permits, all the other things that work against God's will. That's handling the serpent. It's not handling snakes down there in the bayou. It's handling Satan's tricks using people. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Hello? Yeah, your own kids will trick you if you're not in tune. They won't even know they're doing it. So you live in a very deceptive world, but God will give you the truth. You have the belt on you. Can you say amen? And you're quickly moving along. So... We move into an area, remove the demons, we pray, get all built up, and then whatever the devil throws at us, we can handle it because God is directing us. Then it says, if we drink any deadly thing, you mean to say that there are people that would try to poison us? Many times. I was invited up. I wish I had more time than with you. I invited up with a friend, a beautiful friend. I worked at Boeing. His wife was a full-blown witch. Bleed the blood and do all that kind of stuff. 
Well, he would come home every day and talk about what God was doing in his life and meeting me and everything. Wrong thing to do because she started hating me. She says, well, why don't you invite that pastor up for dinner? <laughs> she served pork thinking that I would not eat pork. I might be a Jehovah, no, I mean a seven-day Adventist. And then she cursed it. Who knows what else she did on that, right? Her, here's her husband. He's completely oblivious to, to all the weird upside-down stars in her bedroom and everything. And I went to the bathroom. I kind of peeked in and seen what was going on. And, and so I sat down and I said, well, before we eat this dinner, let's pray. So I prayed, God, Lord, thank you for sanctifying this food, covering it with the blood of Jesus. And I just put as much God out there as I could. She's trembling and wiggling around. I just ate to my heart's delight. I didn't fall over dead. I didn't do anything that was supposed to happen. Not only that, but she ended up leaving the person she married because he was just a, a ploy. You know, there are women who will do that. will marry a man, take everything from him, and then move on. And that's what she did. But guess what? Bam! You ain't going to mess with a child of God. Can you say amen? amen? We're covered in the blood. We're domed by God. And if the only thing that can mess us up is us, then we need to bring ourselves to God and say, keep me from messing up. All right, let's finish with you. So when you go into an area, somebody asks for a city to be prayed for. We bind up all the devils control in that city. We remove their assignment in Jesus' name. Then we release the angels to go in and start gathering up the souls because every human being is an heir of salvation. And then we command all the corruption to be plucked up and then we command all, be torn down and that God would plant righteous people in those positions so that people won't be oppressed. They will be blessed. That's a prayer bomb. You can lob you can shoot, sniper somebody, and get them into the kingdom. I already showed you last week how to claim somebody. You can lob grenades into the ki Can I tell you one more story? I know I'm keeping along. Back in the day when I was really adventurous, we would, used, we would go on prayer drives, get in the car and go pray for places. And God had us go down to Des Moines, and in Des Moines, see, I was raised in Des Moines, Des Moines Midway area when I was a kid. And there was a hippie head shop in Des Moines right next to the theater that's still there. And they were selling drugs and, and they were a witchcraft covenant. And so God says, go in there and rebuke them. So we pulled up, three of us guys. I went in there with a friend, went in there, took authority over everything. The guys yelling and screaming. They all left, ran out of there screaming. And we just prayed over everything. And a week later, it was shut down. So you can do a lot of things if God's directing you. One other time in my neighborhood, we went up with a friend named David and another friend, his, his girlfriend and my, my ex-wife. We went up and we prayed over some property. And guess what? That's where Casey Treat built his first church, right on that property that we prayed over. So don't limit what God can do through you, Okay. All right, let me bless you, shall I? Huh? Oh, thank you, Pastor, for blessing me. All right, you guys. Father, thank you so much for letting me keep them over. I hope they got a lot out of this today. Bless our food and our fellowship together. Bless those people this week that have jobs and things that they have to do. Lord, let them do with joy and grace and put to practice what we learned here today. In Jesus' name, and we all said, bless you. Have a great day.